Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Core Studio. Welcome to the show. So recently I did an episode on the custom magic set, Dark Souls Hollows of Lordran. On that episode, I went through the 20 commanders in the main set, and many of you seemed to really enjoy that episode, but many of you also had some questions in the comments. Like, where in the world is this character? Or where's that character? Or why isn't this character on a card? Well, get ready to praise the sun, because on this episode, I'm going to be going over the commanders from the Dark Souls Commander expansion. That's right, Solar is here in all of his sun-praising glory. And of course, Solar is joined by a lot of your other favorites from Dark Souls. In fact, there are 20 commanders in total from this commander expansion. Now, before we jump into all those amazing commanders, a big thank you to Zoo for designing this amazing custom set and commander expansion, which I am covering today. And of course, a huge thank you to everyone else who helped out with this set, and you can find all their names on the credits at DarkSoulsMTG.com. There, of course, you'll find the rest of the Commander expansion as well as the entire original set. Also, you can join the Dark Souls MTG Discord with the invite link in the description below. But with all that said, let's jump into it and praise the sun. First up, of course, we have Solaire Seeker of Sunlight, hashtag praise the sun. Solaire is a 3-3 human knight for one red-white. Whenever Solaire Seeker of Sunlight and exactly one other creature attack, they each gain double strike until end of turn. And of course, Solaire has partner. Because of course Solaire is not going to be going into battle without a buddy like you. Or like another one of these commanders that we're going to mention here in a bit. Anyways, regardless, Solaire wants to go into battle with exactly one other creature. Because when that happens, not only does Solaire hit harder, but your other creature hits harder as well. So obviously, if you've got a partner that can go really big like Ishai, it can become a one-shot kill really quickly. So pairing Solaire with another commander that hits hard can be a great way to go about things. And then, of course, you can have other ways to pump them as well to make them truly grossly incandescent. You, you know the reference to what Solaire said in Dark Souls? <clears throat> Anyways, let's move on to another Boros commander with Ornstein, Tester of Mortals. Ornstein is a 4-4 demigod knight with Vigilance and Haste that costs 3 red-white. It says, whenever one or more creatures with power 2 or less block, Ornstein, Tester of Mortals deals 4 damage to each player. And again, like every other commander on this list, Ornstein has partner, and because every other commander has partner, I'm just not gonna say that anymore, but don't think that I missed it, I'm just not saying it, okay? So when one or more tiny creatures block, Ornstein punishes everyone. And that includes you. Though there are plenty of ways to mitigate the downside on this card. The easiest way would to actually just make it into an upside. Simply give Ornstein lifelink, and now you're going to be gaining life instead of losing it. If all four players are still alive, you're going to be dishing out 16 total damage, four of which is going to be to yourself. But since you're dishing out 16 damage, you are also gaining 16 life, and so basically, yeah, in total, you're gaining 12. So every single time a tiny creature blocks, your opponents are losing life, and you're gaining a ton of life. So yeah, I would work on flooding the board with tiny creatures, including giving your opponents tiny creatures, and also forcing attacks. With a couple of blocks on each strip around the table, Ornstein can easily keep you alive and punish your opponents. And of course, you can punish your opponents further with damage doublers, so have fun with that. But next up, since we talked about Ornstein, we of course have to talk about Smo. Smo Grizzly Executioner is a 5-5 human warrior with menace that costs 2 black green. It must be blocked by 2 or more creatures if able. Smo is the type of commander that just wants to swing and swing and swing again. You suit Smo up with even more equipment, it's hitting even harder than it's just swinging its giant hammer around and taking out all of your opponent's creatures. 
Since it must be blocked by two or more creatures, your opponents are going to have trouble keeping their creatures on the board. If an opponent only has a few key creatures in play, well, they can say goodbye to those. So, in a way, Smo is like a Voltron commander that can also somehow act as targeted removal. Equipment that gives Smo things like Death Touch and Trample can come in really handy. And of course, so does Double Strike. So, yeah, maybe you just want to partner with Solaire, and that'd be a weird but really fun combination. I mean, just picture walking into an Orlando and expecting to go up against Smo and Ornstein, and all of a sudden, it's Smo and Solaire. <clears throat> Anyways, funny Dark Souls things aside, let's jump into Big Hat Logan, which is a funny Dark Souls thing. Big Hat Logan is a 3-3 human wizard that costs 2 blue-red. He has at the beginning of your upkeep put the top 4 cards of your library into your graveyard until end of turn you may cast a non-creature card put in your graveyard this way. So Big Hat Logan mills you and gives you access to a non-creature card that you hit off the top. And in a spell slinger deck you can easily hit a non-creature spell off the top 4 cards most of the time. So it can provide you a lot of useful card advantage throughout the game. Also, you can just partner with another commander that really cares about the graveyard like someone like Tormod. Essentially, this is guaranteed mill on your upkeep, and yeah, that can be a fantastic thing for that kind of a deck. Or you can go in an artifacts direction, or an enchantments direction, etc, etc. There are a lot of ways that you can take Big Hat Logan. So I guess you could say that Big Hat Logan can wear a lot of hats get it? Okay, no, that was bad. Anyways, now though, let's move on to Artorius the Wolf Knight. Artorius is a 4-7 demigod knight that costs 3 green-white. It says if a source would deal damage to a creature other than Artorius the Wolf Knight, you may have that damage be dealt to Artorius instead. If you do, you gain that much life. So yeah, can you say indestructible? I envision a deck with a partner commander that has red. You use one of many ways to make Artorius indestructible, and then you cast something like a Blasphemous Act. Your partner commander is fine because you can redirect that damage to Artorius. And Artorius is fine because it has indestructible. So Artorius just took 26 total damage, you gain that much life, and then the rest of the board is pretty much wiped. Now additionally, or actually in another direction, you could make this into a very political commander. Again, either give Artorius indestructibility or give it more toughness, and then you can, oh, just make some deals. If an opponent's creature is gonna die in combat, you can just say, hey, I'll have that damage get redirected to Artorius, but what are you gonna do for me? Their creature stays alive, you gain some life, and you also got a deal out of it. However you build it, it could be a lot of fun. And actually, one commander that you might pair Artorius up with is, of course, Artorius' best friend, Sif. Sif Great Grey Wolf is a 5-4 wolf with vigilance that costs 2 green-white. It has equip abilities you activate cost 3 less to activate. So yeah, a partner commander like Artorius that wants to have a lot of things equipped to it can work really well with Sif. Significantly cutting down or completely eliminating an equip cost is huge. You can essentially freely equip whatever you want without having to pay extra. And of course, if you say have Leon and Shikari out in play, you can just equip things at instant speed and yeah, just move things wherever you need to, whenever you need to. So have fun with that. Regardless, yeah, there are plenty of commanders out there that can really utilize equipment, so Sif would be a great partner for them. I mean, just think about the adorable combination of Rograk and Sif. You've got this tiny little kobold running around and, you know, this giant wolf just, you know, handing it equipment to smack your opponents with. What could be more fun than that? How about Sigmire Errant Ally? Sigmire is a 3-3 human knight for blue-red. Sigmire has, at the beginning of combat on your turn, choose an opponent at random. Sigmire Errant Ally attacks that player this combat if able. And whenever Sigmire deals combat damage to a player this turn, draw a card. So Sigmire definitely means well and tries his best, but sometimes, well, he's a bit errant. You might attack a player that you didn't really prefer to attack, and uh, unfortunately, that's just what happens when you play Sigmire. So you very well might poke a bear that you didn't end up meaning to poke, and all of a sudden you've got a huge enemy that really wants to take you down. Regardless, it is absolutely crucial that you make Sigmire essentially unblockable, because Sigmire is going to get himself into a lot of trouble if you don't. Luckily, if you do have a way to consistently get Sigmire through, you're going to get a lot of card advantage out of it. Especially if you've got a way to take advantage of that combat damage trigger with something like Double Strike. So yeah, Sigmire and Solaire can be a great duo as well. Though I'm not sure if Solaire would prefer to partner with Sigmire over Smo. Truly something to ponder. Anyways, of course now we've got to talk about Sigmire's daughter, Sieglind Leal Daughter. 
She's a 2-4 human knight that costs 1 white blue. She has, whenever she deals combat damage to a player, return target creature card with converted mana cost to her last from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, of course, when Sigmeyer gets in a lot of trouble and ends up dying, well, Siglin can actually, you know, save the day and get him back. And then he's probably gonna die again, and then Sieglin's gotta do it again. Regardless, this commander is fantastic at reanimating small creatures. So you're gonna want to have ways to get creatures into your graveyard that she can then get back for you. So Mill could definitely be a strategy for this deck, especially since this is a blue commander and you've got access to the best Mill cards. And of course, you're gonna want to find ways to guarantee that you can get her through, and also again by giving her double strike, you're getting that combat damage trigger twice. So maybe you've got some small but effective creatures that have death triggers that you can sacrifice or ones that have ETBs that help you when they come in. There's a lot of different things that you can do with this commander. Or of course, you know, you can just have Siglin babysit Sigmeyer because that's a thing too. But next up, let's move on to Alvina Hunt Mother. Alvina is a 3-3 cat advisor with flash that costs two green blue. She has whenever an opponent is dealt five or more damage, each other player than that player draws a card. So this commander encourages players, including yourself, to hit your opponents. And not just to hit them, but to hit them decently hard. Because when that opponent is dealt five or more damage, well, every other player gets to draw a card. So if a lot of big creatures swing at someone and some of them get through, well, that's gonna be some card draw for all those other players. Or, you know, you could pair this commander with a commander that has red and get some high damage burn spells to, you know, hit your opponents for quite a bit as well. If you ping all your opponents for five damage, you're gonna be drawing three cards. And maybe those are more burn spells, so have fun from there. Regardless, again, like a lot of these commanders, there's quite a few directions that you can take this deck. You could go big creatures, you could go burn, you could even go politic. But another commander that you can take in a few directions is Black Iron Tarkus. He has, whenever a creature leaves the battlefield, put a plus plus one counter on Black Iron Tarkus. And by removing two plus plus one counters from Tarkus, it gains indestructible until end of turn. So just by getting a few counters on Tarkus, he can be really hard to deal with. My first thought was pairing this up with a plus plus one counter commander like Rayhan Last of the Abzan. Get a ton of counters on this and just go to town. Remove two counters, cast a Wrath, and wipe the board and get an absurd number of counters on this. But of course, another direction that you can go with this commander is Blink. By blinking or flickering a lot of creatures, you can get more and more counters on this commander. And again, the more counters that it gets, the harder it hits and the harder it is to deal with. So Black Iron Tarkus definitely lives up to his name. Just make sure you keep him away from, you know, any beams or scaffolding that he might try to walk on and just fall off and just die because, yeah, Dark Souls lore. And speaking of Dark Souls lore, there's Pinwheel, and I'm not gonna get into that creepy and sad backstory, but I will get into the card. Pinwheel Maskaball is a 4-2 horror wizard that costs two blue-black. Whenever Pinwheel Maskaball attacks, you may discard a card. If you do, create two 2-2 two, two blue illusion creature tokens with, when this creature becomes the target of a spell, sacrifice it. So Pinwheel is a token generator based on attacking and discarding a card. So my first thought with this commander is to find ways to benefit from actually discarding those cards. Maybe that deals with madness or reanimator, etc, etc. Regardless, though those illusions are vulnerable if they ever become the target of a spell, well, they're still effective as creatures. Essentially, every time you attack, you're getting an additional 4 power on the board over 2 bodies. And of course, if you've got ways to pump those tokens, maybe a Catharsis Crusade if you've got a white commander partnered with this, you're gonna have a lot of fun. But anyways, next up, let's move on to Quaylog Chaos Witch. She's a 2-4 spider demon with menace that costs 1 black red. Whenever she attacks, it deals damage equal to its power to an opponent chosen at random. So in a way, it's kind of like a vile smasher that dishes out damage randomly. But rather than damage be based on something like a spell's mana value, it's based off of this commander's power. So obviously, you're gonna wanna increase her power. Not only will she hit harder with her attack, but she's also gonna hit that unfortunate player harder that she randomly chooses. So of course, you can also utilize lifelink cards to really gain a lot of value out of this. Essentially, every time you attack with her, you're going to be gaining twice as much life as her power. And, you know, you might also just want to find a way to give her Infect because, yeah, that could be a lot of fun. You get her power up to 10, you swing, and then, yeah, one of the opponents is just randomly dead. Without even having to get combat damage through. Or multiple opponents if you've got extra combat spells, so have fun with that too. And speaking of fun, let's talk about Quailana, Mother of Fire. She's a 3-3 human shaman that costs 2 red-green. She can tap to add red-red or tap and exile 2 cards from your graveyard to create a 2-2 red and green shaman creature token with tap add red. So this is a mana dork shaman that can make more mana dork shamans. 
Yeah, things can get out of control pretty quickly with this commander when you build the deck in a certain way. Now, either casting a lot of spells or more likely milling yourself is going to be the most effective way to fill your graveyard quickly. Then you can start tapping your commander to make those shaman dorks. And you're probably going to have some ways to untap your commander to do that again and again and again. Then you've just got an army of shaman dorks that you can tap for a ton of mana and cast like a fireball thingy if you really want to, or you can, you know, pump them in combat and swing out too. And of course, there's also some fantastic shaman tribal cards out there like Sachi, Daughter of Sashiro. So with her in play, you can have your shamans tap for even more mana and do even more absurd things. But now let's move on to the Fair Lady. She's a 2-3 spider demon with reach that costs one black green. She asks, whenever a non-token creature dies, you may pay two life if you do create a 1-2 green spider token with reach. So this is sort of like an ogre slumlord type commander, but for spiders instead of rats. And you know, you lose a little bit of life, but that's okay. You're in green and black, you've got plenty of ways to gain a lot of life when creatures die. So either find ways to get a lot of creatures in play and then to sacrifice those creatures and then get them back and get a lot of spiders and gain life and train your opponents. Or, you know, get rid of your opponent's creatures or do both. There's a lot of powerful things that you can do with a commander like this. And again, this is one that you can get down early. So you can build a massive spider army pretty quickly. And again, it's going to be hard for your opponents to get creatures through because those spiders also have reach. So sorry, flyers. I see this deck finishing opponents off with a lot of Zulaport Cutthroat and Blood Artist type of facts. But now let's move on to a very different commander with Laurentius Humble Pupil. Laurentius is a 2-2 human shaman that costs 1 red green. He has spells you cast that target creatures cost 2 less to cast. So this is like a Killian Ink Duelist, but as a Gruul commander that you can also partner. There's a lot of exciting things that you can do with a commander like this. In a Spell Slinger build, this can provide you a lot of value throughout the game by reducing the cost of your spells. If you've got a bunch of spell slinging cantrips out there, well, you can just cast spell after spell after spell, maybe cast some rituals, and have a lot of fun with that. You can also have an enchantress strategy where you're saving a lot of mana on casting auras. Or, of course, if you've got a control strategy, you can easily take out your opponent's creatures with your spells that have a reduced cost. So yeah, though this commander seems pretty simple, there are a lot of different directions that you can take it, and it can be very powerful. Anyways, next up, let's move on to Priscilla Crossbreed. Priscilla is a 3-3 demigod cleric that costs 2 white-blue. She has, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put a plus also encounter on Priscilla Crossbreed, it gains lifelink and hexproof until end of turn. So first off, the more non-creature spells that you cast, the bigger Priscilla gets. It can definitely lend itself to somewhat of a spell-slinging Voltron strategy if you really want to. And Priscilla can continue to pad your life total because again of that lifelink. And on top of that, she also has built-in protection. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, she gets hexproof. So again, like I mentioned with the last commander, a bunch of cantripping cards could be very effective with this. An opponent tries to take her out, and you essentially just cast a spell that replaces itself, draws you a card, and gives her lifelink and hexproof until end of turn while also growing her. So this can be an aggressive commander that can be very helpful in a lot of strategies. But next up, it's time for us to move on to a very different commander with Petrus False Friend. Petrus is a 2-2 human cleric that costs white-black. He has, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So this is kind of like a corpse knight as a commander. And yeah, a commander like this can take your opponents out in absolutely no time with the right strategy. One direction that you might take this is tokens. You just make a ton of tokens and your tokens can hit your opponents and they also drain your opponents when they come in. Another direction could be mass reanimation. You get a bunch of creatures out, then you sacrifice them, then you get them back out. With your other blood artist type effect, you drain your opponents even further, and of course, Petrus drains them as well. You could even take this commander in a blink direction or utilize it as a combo piece for a creature that can enter the battlefield infinitely. So yeah, for just a two mana commander, this commander can be quite potent. And your opponents will probably realize pretty quickly that Petrus isn't their friend. But now it's time for us to move on to Lady of the Darkling. She's a 2-4 human knight with lifelink that costs 1 blue black. She has at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, scry 2. Now while scrying isn't card advantage, it is card selection and can really help you out throughout the game. Or you know, if you partner this with Elgith Crossroads Augur, then it is card advantage. Because the partner commander Elgith turns all your scrying into card draw. So that's probably exactly what I would do, utilizing these two as a fantastic pair. Have some creatures that you actually want to sacrifice for some extra value, and then also, you know, Scry 2, which turns into card draw. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of other partner commanders out there that could be very effective with Lady of the Darkling, but that's just the first one that came to mind. Next up, though, let's move on to Dusk, Princess of Ulasil. Dusk is a 0-3 human wizard with Defender that costs green-blue. She has at the beginning of combat on each player's turn, you may pay 2. If you do, put a Bustle Swan counter on target creature that player controls, that creature can't be blocked this turn. This commander has politics written all over it. 
You are going to be wheeling and dealing with opponents, pumping their creatures, and helping them get through on your other opponents. So essentially, you're going to utilize your opponent's creatures to do your dirty work for you. And then when it's one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to probably steal your opponent's creatures and then kill them with their own creatures that you pump throughout the game. So yeah, an everyone swings, oh but not at me kind of strategy can really work well with this commander. Just make sure that you're good at politicking or at least are practicing your politicking when playing this one. And make sure that you've solidified your very clear deal before you actually, you know, pump their creature and make it unblockable. Because you don't then want that creature coming at you. But the final commander from the Dark Souls Commander expansion is Calamite Abyss Dragon. It's a 4-4 dragon with flying that costs 3 black red. It says if another source would deal damage to an opponent, it deals twice that much damage. This counts any and all sources except for this one. So that counts your other creatures, your other spells, as well as your opponent's creatures and spells. Again, everything hits your opponents twice as hard except this. So group slug and forced attacks could definitely be a way to take this commander. And you can also incentivize attacks to go a certain way, potentially with something like curses. So everyone's swinging at your opponents, hitting everyone else for a ton, and you're going to be taking a lot less if someone decides to swing at you. Yeah, a game with this commander in play can go pretty quickly. Especially if you pick certain other commanders to partner with it that can already hit hard. Like I mentioned with Solaire, Ishai can take out your opponents in absolutely no time with this as its partner. Or you know, Solaire partner with this is going to be dishing out 12 damage when it hits. So have fun praising the sun with your Abyss Dragon. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one.